thank you for coming today evening and i'll speak today on the topic of facing our fears in the bhagavad gita in 1835 krishna says ayam swapnam bhayam shokam vishadam madame imach navitum chuti durme dha dhati sapat tamasi he says that when the mind is affected by ignorance one of the results of that is fear bhay aya swapnam bhayam shokam there is day dreaming the things will be so wonderful or there can be nightmarish fantasies or things will be so dreadful so both characterize a mind which is affected by ignorance and the bhagavad gita itself is a book which takes one from ignorance to transcendence so i take this first uh, and i'll talk this in two three main parts first i'll talk about you know where this fear comes from second i'll talk about the four principles for dealing with fear which we the bhagavad gita offers and then we we'll conclude by some things practical which we can do when we face fear so some people say that everything is in the mind everything is in the mind if your mind is strong then there are no problems mm. i was at one science and spirituality conference and the other another spiritual teacher i was one of the speakers and another speaker and this speaker said that actually everything is in the mind if you make your mind strong you will not have any problems so for the last 25 years every day i smoke i was supposed to be spiritual teacher so every day i smoke and i have no lung problems at all why because the mind is strong <laughs> <laughs> and he gave that speech and i think after 6 months or something he got lung cancer and he died within 6 months after that so there are three levels of reality there is physical reality there is mental reality and there is spiritual reality so to say that everything is in the mind is to deny physical reality so for example if a car is racing toward us we will feel fear and that fear is not just in the mind that fear is caused by something which is out there which is invoking that reaction to this now of course for some people fear may make them run away and they save their lives but some people fear may petrify them petrify means it comes from the petrius petrius is the adjective for stone so petrify means to make like a stone it is become frozen and then that fear prevents a healthy reaction which is running away so there are situations when fear is not only desirable it is essential because the world has real dangers in it and our body is designed in such a way that when there is a danger say if you look down from a 100 uh, story 100 level building you feel you fear that's good that keeps us safe so first thing is that fear itself is not always undesirable you know and desirable at times it's essential so then we could say fear comes from the physical reality when it comes from the physical reality at that time it is desirable but not all our fears come from physical reality alone for us many of our fears something may start from the physical reality but at the mental level things get expanded exaggerated so we might just see a strange look in the eyes of our boss and say hey, is my boss going to fire me now the boss may nothing like that in their mind but from that one glance so the mind starts a horror movie and now what if i am fired who will have to get the mortgage for my house if i can't get the mortgage in bilbao and be evicted from my house Oh, if I'm alone on the streets, it's so cold, and we'll be shivering, thinking of the future cold. Although right now we are comfortable. So basically, 
everything is not in the mind but everything comes through the mind everything that we experience is experienced through the mind so there are situations where fear is desirable and there are healthy fears in life but there are situations when fear is undesirable because the physical reality may not be dangerous or whatever danger is the mind is a response to it the mind is a reaction to it is exaggerating and taking us away from the right response so now how does our mind respond in many ways the mind is like a software we consider a computer system where there is a hardware software and user so the hardware is like the body the physical reality the mind is the software and the soul is the user so in uh, many computer programs or automations there is a trigger response system like say if somebody presses the particular button there is a trigger that the door opens somebody else presses the particular button the door closes so there is a trigger and there is a response so like that now the connection between the trigger and the response is in a in a complicated machine we don't see that at all what we see is okay i press this button and this door opened this so, that's how we perceive but there is a whole complicated mechanism through which the trigger produces a response now sometimes if that mechanism gets spoiled then you press the button for opening the door and the door closes so the opposite response comes it's especially dangerous if you press the brake and the accelerator starts <laughs> <laughs> that would be especially dangerous so so basically for us is a trigger many the world sends us many triggers and depending on what is in the mind there is a response so bhayam dvitiya abhinivesha tasya ishat apetasya viparyo asmriti the bhagavatam the lalit canto says that bhayam dvitiya abhinivesha tasya where in our mind gets caught in duality then at that time it becomes overwhelmed by fear dvitiya abhinivesha now what do we mean by duality at one level the world is filled with dualities some things are good some things are bad some things it's hot some things it's cold some things it's uh, some of the people are kind some of the people are rude so these dualities are there and we can't live blind to the dualities so if it's cold then we may have warm clothes we are warm clothes and what so we have to be aware of the dualities but when we become obsessed with the dualities when we can't see anything beyond the duality that is when fear catches us so it's not duality that causes fear it is obsession with duality what why how does obsession with duality cause fear that means okay this is good this is bad but when i get caught only in this then i want the good at all costs and i want to avoid the bad at all costs but actually nothing in the world is so so disastrous that it has to be got at all costs when we get obsessed we just our mind like the glue gets fixed on that thing this is what it has to be this way so basically fear is the other side of desire when we have a strong desire for something the other side of the desire is fear what if i don't get it hmm? so in 1611 in the bhagavad gita krishna says that chintam aparineyam cha pralayantam upashitah kamo pabhoga parama etavad iti nischitah kamo upabhoga parama when one thinks that sensual pleasures of the world are life's ultimate purpose now if we want worldly pleasures then they are not in our control always so we might have some things today and tomorrow they may go so the more we we think that getting these pleasures alone is the goal of life the more what happens worry takes over 
what he starts dominating our consciousness. Chintam aparimeyamcha, immeasurable anxiety. So, anxiety is caused, not say for example, if we have, a, a, we have some wealth, we have invested somewhere the wealth, and maybe the stocks go down, and then we get worried. That's understandable. But if we are so obsessed with money, oh, if I lose this, then my whole life is lost. But yes, money is important and loss of money is a problem. But our self-worth shouldn't be reduced to our net worth. <laughs> <laughs> yes, our net worth matters. That's a part of our self-worth. But it is not the whole of our self-worth. So basically, the stronger our desire for something, this is how it should be, this is how it should not be. Then, that is what causes fear to us. So, the way I have been going till now is that, fear, there are fearful stimuli in the world at the physical level. But, in the mind at the level of trigger response. Sometimes there might be a small trigger, but there is a big response. And an excessive response is because the mind is attached to, is obsessed with duality. And this is what I have to have it this way. And this is unacceptable. This will be a disaster. Well, yes, some things can be disastrous, but our mind often exaggerates this. So it is, everything comes through the mind. And the fears that we experience, most of our fears, are actually more in the mind than at the physical level. How if, suppose, uh, a deer is wandering in the jungle looking for some grass, it lives in mortal fear at any moment a tiger may pounce on it and eat it, rip it apart and eat it alive. Now, how many of us when we go out we have the fear that some cannibal will pounce on us and eat us alive? <laughs> no way. <laughs> Cannibalism is almost extinct. Hmm? So, we don't have that much physical fears. So, now this is not to say that there are no fearful situations. Fear physically, there are fearful situations, but it's our mind which exaggerates things. So, then facing our fears requires the physical reality, that is the mental reality, and the spiritual reality. So, so how do we face our fears? It is by positioning ourselves properly. I'll explain what I mean by positioning ourselves properly. That our consciousness can sometimes be only at the physical level. Mm -hmm. Say for example, if we are eating something very delicious or we are having a very painful injury, our whole consciousness is caught at the physical level. Or sometimes, you know, we are just doing daydreaming. Then physically we might be in one place, but we are fantasizing in another place. So there are consciousness almost completely caught at the mental level. So we could consider this like a three-level building, and our consciousness like a torch, like or the beam coming from a torch. So sometimes the consciousness can be the beam is focused on the first level, then the physical level. Sometimes the beam is focused on the second level, and sometimes the beam is focused on the third level. Now, the beam comes from the source of consciousness is the soul. The beam comes from the soul. Mm -hmm. uh, it can focus on spiritual reality, it can get caught in the mental reality, or it can come from the third level to the second level to the first level. So it always starts from the third level. But from the third level to the second, first le third level itself, third level to the second level, third level to the first level. Mm -hmm. So now, when our consciousness is at the physical, is at the mental level, caught at the mental level. That's when fear overwhelms us. Let's look at how, what happens to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. So he is about to fight the biggest war of his life. Fear is a very peculiar thing. Some people have great fear of uh, spiders. Anyone knows what is the word for that? Arachnophobia. Yeah, so now I used to think that those who have arachnophobia, they feel fear when they see spiders. Actually, that's not exactly true. Yes, they do feel fear.
fear when they see a spider. But they feel much bigger fear when the spider disappears. <laughs> hey, it was there, where did it go? Is it going to come and sit on me now? <laughs> so what happens is, when something is physically tangible, there is some fear. But when something becomes physically intangible or not visible, then the mind can imagine even more. So, there is a physical stimulus, but there is the mind's imagination which is the primary cause of fear. So now, if we are to deal with fear, how do we deal with it? Like, then we, want to, we want to deal with it at the physical level also. But primarily the mind is over imagination that often becomes the problem. So to deal with the mind, to prevent the mind's over imagination, what do we do? There are broadly, we could say, four principles. That is, I'll talk about this in terms of an acronym, IDEA, I-D-E-A. So identity, divinity, energy and activity. So the Bhagavad Gita in a sense leads Arjuna in this flow. So Arjuna at the start of the Gita is fearful. Now normally whenever a warrior has to fight a war, there is always the possibility of death. And courage is not the, necessarily the absence of fear. Courage is the presence of a purpose bigger than fear. When the soldiers go to fight a war, it's not that they are, have no fear of death. It's rather their love for their country. Or maybe they may also a love for their salary. Not everybody is patriotic. But whatever it is, there is a purpose bigger than fear. So, the, when, so fear comes, not there is always fear, but courage is not just the absence of fear. Courage is the presence of a purpose bigger than fear. Now, when Arjuna came to the battlefield, he knew that this is a war and war, death happens. And yet, he was not fearful. How did fear overcome him to such an extent that he was crying in public? And normally, no matter how much fear we have, we don't cry in public. We don't want people to call us cry babies or something like that. And especially for a warrior, warriors are trained not to show pain, not to show any weakness. And yet for him to be crying in public means that it must have been a source of, something must have caused him great agony. So what happened exactly? So he came to the war field ready to fight. And then he told Krishna, Sena Yoruba Yorumadhe, Vatamsthapayame Achyuta. At least place my heart, my chariot between the two arms. Yavade Tan Nirikshena, Yodukama Navastitan. Let me see who are the people assembled over here. And then as he saw this, his imagination appeared. His imagination was not only. All the great warriors over there will be killed. But when the warriors are killed, at that time, the whole dynasty will be destroyed. Generally, whenever in society the protectors are destroyed, then there are always predators. So the predators will exploit the women, and then all kinds of disasters will fall before the society. So he started thinking about all this and he became overwhelmed. And then he just said, I can't fight. So earlier I talked about being petrified. Arjuna became petrified. His bow slipped, almost started slipping out from his hand. He sat down, I can't fight. So, it's interesting that normally speaking, uh, the normal convention is that a warrior when the warrior is about to fight a war, the warrior doesn't show any fear. Arjuna was completely fearful. So what did Krishna do? Krishna started by first things first. He said, 
you are afraid of death you are afraid that they will be killed arjuna was not so much afraid that he will be killed as a warrior he was he always lived in the shadow of death but his fear was that everybody would be killed society itself would be devastated so then he says begins with i i is identity identity is he tells that whatever you are perceiving as a danger like the physical stimulus and there is a mental reaction and then you think that the physical everything will be destroyed but even if everything is destroyed you will not be destroyed because you are an indestructible soul avinashi tu tadvidhi yena sarvam idam tatam avinashi the soul is indestructible and the mind can imagine all horrific ways in which the weapons might kill someone shita says none of those weapons can even scratch the soul nainam chinnati shastraani nainam dahati pavaka na chainam kledayan vyapo na shoshyati marutaha that uh, the soul cannot be pierced the soul cannot be burned the soul cannot be withered the soul cannot be evaporated it cannot be damaged in any way at all so then when he speaks this at that time this itself gives some assurance and this is not just some abstract conception actually if we think say right now you are sitting you are observing me and i am observing you so what is happening over here that there is a physical reality we say for me you are present for you i am present and then linking both of us is a stream of consciousness and you are the observer of this you are the you take in take this stream in and then it process it so actually in every situation that we are in we can we can perceive that i exist about this situation once i was in a hospital i was having a was admitted and i was having various complications so the doctor gave me like a, a blood transfusion but i had so the so the bottle was like half filled and it was supposed to be the blood was supposed to go in and i was tired of sleeping and then i woke up and i saw that the blood had, that the bottle had become full so something had somehow gone wrong and instead of blood going in the blood had come out at that time initially i panicked but then it struck me that actually it has a tube over here it is coming in and inside also there are tubes so i am different from this so just a few moments of course immediately i call the nurse and they fix whatever had gone wrong but the point is that okay this body is there is blood in that tube and there is blood in the tube over here this is i am different from that tube with the blood i am different from the tube with the blood over here it's not that bad i had that realization always but somehow at that point i was able to observe myself from a little bit of distance so all of us are vulnerable to pain and fear and horror when something like this happens but actually at one level we are the experiencers of the pain but at another level we are the observers for seeing it so our our identity exists different from the body many people when they have some traumatic accidents or something like that they have near death experiences they have out of body experiences and i had according to research almost one out of every 10 people has had a near death experience in the western world especially so people they say see themselves from above this physical situation and they they can actually record and tell report what happened no this doctor said uh, the doctor when i was when i was being operated the doctor said this and the, they said that and uh, uh, various things they can talk at that they can talk and they can hear so they can they, they can hear what others are talking they can't talk because they don't have the physical mechanism to talk but the point is our we exist above whatever dangers we are facing so now this identity is not just a matter of theory it is also something which can be realized by practice we shall talk about it a little later this, that is what is the acronym we are discussing identity identity Ide. Ide. so identity is the first one so the point i am making is that we change our minds programming 
so that when some stimulus comes at the physical level a trigger comes it doesn't it doesn't cause a overwhelming imagination negative imagination so if i understand okay the situation is there but i exist above it that identity is what can enable us to get some level of security now d is divinity divinity means uh, that actually generally that is we have a certain amount of control and then whatever is causing us fear is out there out of our control so when we understand that there is god that there is a divine controller that means okay this problem may be big it may be bigger than me but god is bigger than that but he is the supreme reality and to the extent we focus on the danger our mind will make it bigger and bigger and bigger but to the extent we focus on god we remember that he is the biggest reality then we start seeing the problem in perspective so bhayam dvitiya abhinivesitasya ishad apetasya viparyayo asmutihi so ishad apetasya say if we see some if we are walking on a street a dark street and if somebody looks like a thief like a looks like a thief coming if we see that person we become fear but if we see just nearby there is a cop the cop is strong the cop also has a gun we look at the cop we then our fear will go away so so similarly for us there are dangers in the world and the dangers need to be dealt with but the first thing to deal with the danger is to not let our mind exaggerate the danger so there is divinity divinity means god is in control and he is he can protect us he is our ultimate protector he is competent enough to take to handle any danger he is bigger than any problem that we may have of course when we approach god also sometimes if we approach god but our mind is filled not with god but with the danger then we may not experience much relief here we are not talking about god removing the physical problem that we will talk about it later we are talking about right now the the fear has caught our imagination and is becoming bigger and bigger so what we need to do is the 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 mind is exaggerating the danger is a bigger danger right now so if we turn towards god and we turn towards him but if you are not focused on him we focus on the danger then the grip may not go away that's what in the prayers of prayers to narasimha dev uh, there's indra who is a great dev a very powerful but he prays that because hiranyakashipu was terrorizing the universe so our mind with was filled with fear of him and that's why we couldn't worship you properly now that you have eliminated him now we will start we can resume our our pious and devotional activities now that was prayer now prahlad madarani says that my dear lord i am Prahlad never had any fear of Hiranyakashipu. Actually, you see, Hiranyakashipu posed a greater danger to Prahlad than to Indra. Hiranyakashipu never tried to assassinate Indra. He tried many times to assassinate Prahlad. So, now why was Prahlad not that fearful and Indra fearful? Because Prahlad's heart and mind were dominated by Krishna. So, as long as the thought of Krishna was there. the fear of hiranyakashipu was not there now danger because of hiranyakashipu was there and the danger had to be dealt with but the fear unhealthy fear excessive fear was not there so we need to, so that's why what we need to do for first and the second idea identity and divinity and for our identity we need to study the philosophy regularly to remind us that i am a soul and for for remembering the divinity for connecting with the divinity we need to practice bhakti yoga 
Bhakti yoga is not just some ritual, rituals like chant some mantras or do some puja. Yes, these are, those are parts of bhakti yoga, but the essence of bhakti yoga is not to do a ritual. The essence of bhakti yoga is to make our mind spiritual. So there is the mind, body and soul. To do a ritual means, okay, yes, to do your hand like, you know, your hand like this and do an aarti. Or move your fingers and do some mala. That's a ritual. But the essence of bhakti is not just to do something at the physical level. The essence of bhakti is to make our mind spiritual. That means raise our consciousness from the physical level to the spiritual level. So we connect with Krishna through the practice of bhakti. And to the extent we are habituated to connecting with him, to that extent, when danger comes, we will be conscious of the danger, but we won't be conscious only of the danger. We can be conscious of Krishna and then see the danger in perspective. So this is divinity. Now, third point, third point is energy. Now, our energy is something which is very at one level mysterious. See, we might be very enthusiastic about doing something. And if somebody speaks one discouraging word, all our enthusiasm might be like a bubble. Like, like a balloon, one prick, just... So now, at a physical level, nothing has happened. We might still have eaten food and have energy. So, this, this energy is it's somewhat mysterious. So actually, the energy that we have is a combination of the physical and the spiritual. It's just like if you have, if you have to move a car. Now, for moving the car, the fuel has to be there in the car, no doubt. Without fuel, the car can't move. But if the driver is depressed, if the driver is petrified, then no matter how much fuel is there in the car, the car will not. The car has its physical mechanism and it needs fuel as a part of the physical mechanism. But the driver is the source of the energy, source of the motion of the car. We could say that similarly, we have a physical component to our energy and sometimes we might be physically very exhausted but often when we feel depressed depressed people are not physically exhausted actually sometimes there's depressed people they often are so inactive that they get exhausted at being exhausted <laughs> Sometimes some people just, uh, they get so depressed, they don't even get out of their bed. I feel like telling them, you know, you are not sick, your bed is sick of you. <laughs> <laughs> of course, we don't speak that bluntly, or we may, depending on our relationship and the person's nature. But the point is that they may have physical energy, but they don't have internal energy. So what is happening, so where does this energy come from? It is not just from the mind. Ultimately, the soul is a source of consciousness. And consciousness is our fundamental energy. Consciousness is the source of all energies. See, if I am speaking, you are hearing, it's all because the consciousness is there. I talk about consciousness like a, like a beam of light. And the beam of light is 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 only a one part of the role of consciousness because Krishna says one of the describers of the soul is achintyoyam it's inconceivable why because no material metaphor can describe the soul fully so if we talk about the soul to be like a beam of light then it is a beam of light perceives or helps us perceive but a beam of light itself doesn't do anything then a beam of light, it, unless you have some solar activated devices, a beam of light doesn't do anything. So consciousness is, you could say, light energy which enables us to perceive things. But consciousness is also like electrical energy. Now when electricity flows through something, then the fan starts moving. So consciousness is energy, but both these kinds of energies. Now, if we turn on the switch to turn on the fan, 
but the fan doesn't turn on. I mean, no, the bulb is on, and so that means electricity is there. The channel also is the switch is open. That means something is wrong in the passage. If, the, if we know the fan is already functioning, the fan is not damaged, that it can't be there. Then that means in between something is gone wrong. So for us to deal with our fears or to face our fears, basically we need to focus on our energy. What fear does is either it can make us they say fight or flight. Mm -hmm. So usually fight is the response in uh, the mode of passion. In the energy of reading it, it's fight. In the mode of ignorance, it is flight. Mm -hmm. But sometimes in the mode of ignorance, it is not just flight. It can also be freeze. Freeze completely. So, now when this happens, our energy, when somebody is in the mode of passion, the energy, energy is just, you could say they are hyperactive. Mm -hmm. uh, in the mode of passion, ignorance, they are either completely active or they are just thoughtlessly active. So many times they will say some fire breaks out in a crowded place or some danger comes in a movie theater or something like that. More than the damage because of the fire is because of the stampede. People run in panic and they stamp over each other. That's what causes casualties more. So again, this is an example of how our reaction to a problem often makes the problem bigger than what it needs to. The same principle applies to our mind also. So with respect to our energy, we, what happens is, when there is fear, we feel as if this is so big and I can't do anything about it. But we need to use our energy carefully. Okay, in this situation, what can I do? What is in my power to do? Generally, the mind overpowers us by making us feel that we are powerless. That means sometimes it can be if some danger comes. This is so big. What can you do about it? So if we read the news, say there is a recession. And because of this, you know, so many people will be fired from their jobs. What can I do about it? So, what happens is, if we start thinking this problem is so big, it's like it's like an invisible enemy, like an invisible spider. Where do you fight against it? So, we need to, what can I do about it right now? What is in my power to do? Energy. So, do we have energy? Sometimes we feel, oh, this situation is so terrible, I just can't do anything about it. Now, when this comes, when this thought comes, Oh, this trouble is so big, I can't do anything, I'm powerless. Then we need to challenge that idea of the mind with a counterintuitive question. What is that counterintuitive question? The mind says, things are so terrible, you can't do anything. Then, can I make things worse? Hey, things are terrible, why do you want to make them worse? No, no, we don't have to make them worse, but can we make them worse? No matter how bad things are, we never lose the power to make them worse. <laughs> I might be down with the fact, I might have a fracture in my one foot and I am better than for the next six weeks. See, I am powerless, I can't do anything. I can take a fracture and I can take a hammer and fracture my other knee also. <laughs> Obviously, I shouldn't. But the point is, we are not as powerless as we think. If we can make things worse, then we can make them better also. So fear, when it is paralyzing us, see what we are talking about over here is energy. energy. So the idea is that first, the fear acts at the mental level, uh, increasing the imagination in a dangerous way. So first we rise to the spiritual level, going through identity and divinity. That, okay, I am indestructible and God is bigger than this problem. But then what do I, now what do I do about it? Energy is, can I do something about it? What 
what can I do? Once we see what is in our control, now it might be in our control, nothing may be in our control except say maybe calling out to Krishna in helplessness. But even that requires some energy. When Draupadi was dis about to be dishonored, she didn't have the energy to fight against Dushyasa. But still she had the energy to raise up her hands and fervently call out to Krishna. So even in the situation of powerless, we all, powerlessness, we always have some power. Now here when we are talking about energy, it is not just about calling out to Krishna. What can I do practically about it? And then as soon as you feel, say, if my fear is, oh, what if I, this recession is there, what if I lose my job? Okay, what can I do about it? I can make sure that I do my job well. I can make sure that I meet my designs. I can make sure that I'm among the good performance. So I can do something. And so energy, as soon as we get that sense that I have some energy, and we always have some energy, then what happens? That hold of fear on us decreases. And then that brings us to the last part. What is that? A is activity. So, activity means we start doing something. Not something frantic, but something purposeful. Whatever we, we can do. So generally, when we are doing nothing, during our idle time, our mind works overtime. <laughs> and it starts imagining this may happen, that may happen, that may happen. But as soon as we start doing something practical, something physical, which is purposeful and which requires some attention, then the attention is caught is dragged out of the mind and it comes to the physical reality. And once our attention comes to the physical reality and we start doing something, the grip of fear on us decreases. As soon as we start getting engaged in something, our consciousness is no longer available for fear to manipulate. So it's no longer there so much caught in the mind. So that's why one so, so that means we get out of the mind, first we get to the soul. And then you may say, I just can't say at the level of the soul. I have to do something practical. Yes. Look at what energy you have and start doing those things. So for example, there are some people have say claustrophobia. So that's the last part now. Then I talk about how you could apply this practically. So generally, the way to face a fear is to, to expose the mind's lie about the fear. <laughs> so, expose the mind's lie means by some people, they are like, uh, they are paranoid about being in close places. They just can't enter a lift. So like, uh, elevator is like a nightmare for them. So now I will tell them, just the side of the elevator. I can't enter the elevator. Okay. You can't enter the elevator. Mm, can you walk five more steps towards the elevator? Uh, you will be next to me? Yeah, I will be right next to you. Okay, walk five steps near the elevator. And they walk five steps near and they say, hey, hey, nothing happened. They say, that's all I can do. Okay, that's all. Today, that's all I can do. Then tomorrow, take five more steps near the elevator. And then gradually just move closer and closer and closer. Just the small things. And then eventually, they come right to the door of the elevator. So can you enter the elevator? No, I can't. Okay, can you close your eyes and enter the elevator? Mm. Uh, okay. But will you be with me? Yeah, I'll be with you. Can you close your eyes and enter the elevator. Maybe go one step up and come out. Hey, nothing happened. So when we use our energy to do some activity, Whatever it is that is causing us fear, okay, what can I do? The mind may say you can do nothing. But then, okay, can you do some small thing? Yes, I can do this. Once we start doing that, gradually we start countering the fear. So it's not that the so this is I could say this phobias are more like that is irrational, there is no actual danger. But for them the danger is actual. They actually feel great fear over there. Maybe say this all in the mind and you can deal with it like this. But 
But what if there is actual danger? He said, even there also this approach works. Even if there is physical danger, say somebody wants to drive a car and they are very afraid of driving the car. Somebody wants to swim and they are very afraid of swimming. The way to deal with it is just do small, small things. So, okay, you can't drive a car. But can you just sit in the driver's seat? Okay, I can sit there. And then I'll sit next to you. Can you move? A little bit I can move. So whatever our fears are, just you what energy do you have and what activity you can do. And if you focus on those, then even great fears can be dealt with. So fear exists. Fear, fear, fearful things exist in the world, but fear controls us by controlling our mind. And if we can get our consciousness out of our mind, then we can get out of the control of fear. And that's how Krishna says, Machittaha Sarva Durgani Mat Prasada Darishasi. So Krishna tells Arjuna that if you become conscious of me, you will pass over all obstacles by my grace. So Krishna tells Arjuna that don't think that you are killing these people. There is a governing divinity in the world and those people on the opposite side, they have done such terrible karma that they are killed by their own misdeeds. If you don't become an instrument, somebody else, will be, they will be killed in some other way. So Krishna first raises his level to the consciousness to level of identity. That you are a soul. Then there is a supreme soul who is in control. That is his plan which is working. And then Krishna tells Arjuna, use the energy that you have in service of the divine. You are a small, you cannot change the whole nature of the way things are going. But you can use your energy in a way that is constructive. And then do your activity. So that same Arjuna who was so fearful that he had put aside his bow, by the end of the Bhagavad Gita, he picks up his bow, Yatta Yogeshwara Krishna, Yatra Partho Anurudara. He picks up his bow in readiness to fight. And similarly, the world's perceptions can overwhelm us with fear. And we also put aside our metaphorical bow. We lose our determination, our enthusiasm, our confidence to engage with the world. But then by hearing the Gita's wisdom, we all can regain our enthusiasm, regain our determination, regain our confidence and march forward in life. So I'll summarize what I spoke today. I spoke on this theme of So I spoke on this theme today of how we can face our fears. I started by talking about how fear exists. Some people say everything is in the mind. But no, everything comes through the mind. Physical reality is real, but there's mental and spiritual reality. So normally some fears are desirable. There's actual danger. They're not only desirable, but also essential. But most of our fears is a small trigger, but there's an exaggerated response. And then basically it's like the trigger response mechanism has become damaged. That because our mind overimagines. So uh, if the fear prompts an unhealthy response, fear petrifies us, and that's unhealthy. And most of the fears we face in today's world are not like tangible physical stimuli. They are more abstract fears. And that's why, uh, so, okay, what if I lose my job? This, 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 this will happen. So because of that, the mind can imagine much more. And that's why to deal with our fears, we need to deal with fear's control of our mind. And how do we deal with that? I talked about this Mm. Chronic, what is it? Idea. Idea. What is that? Identity. Identity. That I am a soul who is indestructible. This fearful situation, even if it causes great damage, but still I and the soul exist above this. Talk about our consciousness, the soul being the source of consciousness, the beam of light, which comes from the spiritual level, to the mental and to the physical. Now, in the case of fearful situation, it just gets caught in the mental level. And our reaction to the fear, to the danger, can become a bigger danger for us. As happens when people panic during in crowded situations and there is a stampede. So identity means I am indestructible. So we, to get the consciousness out of the mind, we have to raise it to the spiritual level. So regularly hearing 
Bhagavad Gita can help us remember this. Then D was divinity. That there is a God who is in control. God is bigger than our biggest problems, biggest dangers facing us. So rather than looking at the dangers looking for a thief, we look at the strong looking for this. And like that, when we turn toward a God also, our fear may not go away if we are too attached to a particular thing. So fear is not caused by dualities, it is caused by obsession with dualities. So we need to practice Bhakti Yoga not just as a ritual but to make our mind spiritual. Then amid danger, we can disengage our consciousness from the fears of stimuli and focus on Krishna. And then the fear won't get uh, exaggerated. Then after that was the energy. 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 Yeah. Okay. I talk about how our energy is not just a physical energy which you get by taking food. It is also the consciousness and the emotions which you experience. It comes from the soul. And if we are if we are discouraged, depressed, then mm, we have no energy, although we have physical energy. So similarly, when fear takes us over, it misdirects our energy. Either we become petrified or we become panicky and uh, overreact. So flight or fee, no, flight or freeze. It comes right. So then when we feel when we are freezing, oh, I can do nothing. So we need to challenge that. No matter how bad a situation is, we always have the power to make it worse. That means we also have the power to make it better. So okay, this this fear, this danger is there. What can I do about it right now? What is in my power to do? Even if it's a tiny thing, start with that. And that, that brings us with, with that energy, what do you do? Ask it. Activity. Activity. So just start doing what we can. Now what we can do maybe we feel so small that actually there's danger. You know, I just work better at my job, the decision is not going to go away. Okay, that's true. But what will happen is once our consciousness comes out of our mind to the body and gets engaged in something, fears control over our mind and our consciousness will decrease. And thus we will be able to move more effectively. So even if we can't remove the danger, we can remove that we you know, even if we can't remove the cause of the fear, we can remove the control of the fear on our conscience, on our mind by activity. And then I talk about how practically we deal with any fear by again using our energy to do what we can. I can't enter an elevator. Please go a few steps to me. I can't, I can't enter into a car. I can't drive away. Can you enter into a car? Just take small, small steps and you'll find that you'll be able to overcome fear. I talk about how this was Krishna led Arjuna through the Bhagavad Gita also, first told him about the soul, right? then said that there is God's plan happening over here. Don't think you are doing everything. And then what is your energy? You are an archer, train for archery, use that for a godly cause. And then do your activity, do your duty of Akshatriya, the martial guardian of society. Just as Arjuna who had become despondent and fearful, putting aside his bow, picked up his bow by hearing the Gita. Similarly, we can also become confident instead of fearful on understanding the Gita's principles and applying them in our life. Thank you very much. Hare Hare Krishna. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
कृष्णा कल्चर बॉडी we don't work against the body we work with the body hmm? work for the body means any and every desire that comes up we just pander to that desire so prabhupad when he came from india to america he just had a few vegetables and some grains with him he didn't even know whether vegetarian food would be available in america so he came and was ready to live with whatever food was available so he doesn't live for the body but we don't live against the body It means our purpose is not to torture us. Say, so if I, as soon as I, I, I get cold, I expose myself to cold water, I get a cold. Then I don't deliberately go and take a bath in cold water. That will just make me dysfunction. So we don't work for the body, but we don't work against the body. We work with the body. So this is one way just practical for us to understand. and their bodies had the capacity to perform that austerity but that is not the, that, is, that is the way we can look at so that we don't artificially imitate and create make trouble for ourselves so but yes there is also the, as you rightly pointed out the principle of spiritual energy that when the consciousness is focused on doing something Which is very very important for us. That all our energies get channeled in that. And just like a car, the fuel meter might show down, 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 but always has some reserve energy. So like that, we also have reserve energy. But often, unless we are very motivated and inspired and driven to do something, we often don't tap that reserve energy. So in the case of great acharyas, because they were so devoted to Krishna. So even when the body was almost run, like running empty, they would be driven to running towards Krishna. So in some cases, the spiritual can even transcend the material. Mm-hmm. But usually, it is the spiritual works through the material. That means on some occasions, if Prabhupada was once or so sick, but when when cabinet minister had come to meet him, so Prabhupada. Was so sick that he couldn't even apply the luck, and his hand was trembling. So somebody else applied the luck. But when they came to, when he came to meet, Prabhupada himself got up and blessed him, and sat and had lunch with him and talked with him. And after that, minister departed. Prabhupada just collapsed in the chair. That was spiritual energy itself. 
Sometimes the spiritual can manifest in spite of the material. But in normal ways, the spiritual manifests through the material. And that's why towards the end of his life, when his body broke down practically, Prabhupada spent a lot of time in the dark and he didn't do much physical activity, but he had devotees around and hear and read about Krishna and sing about Krishna. So we as in we we don't limit ourselves to the body. We don't understand the soul is different from the body, but the soul is currently working through the body. So we can't completely neglect the body also. Any other questions? I have a good question where I am not completely purified in somebody in the Vishnu after mm. being in the body. How to deal with the situation when at the time when we are being in the body? And you know that uh, uh, you are not completely, uh, you know, in, at the stage where you are in the body. How to deal with that? Yeah, how to get rid of the cough that we are not completely rid of the condition and on death. I do different things. You know, generally, at the time of death, there are multiple fears. One is about the past, or three fears are present about the past, about the present, about the future. About the past is everything that we have worked for, we are going to lose it. At the present, so the body is breaking down, we are having all kinds of pain. In the future, where we are going to go? Broadly, these are the fears that everyone has. Now, if we have practiced the bhakti diligently, the fear of the past, losing the past, not so much there. Yes, we have loved ones and we have done things in the body. It is, it is, it is sad to go from there. This, it does come out of pain. But we have developed a higher attachment. So now the body getting broken down, that's that's of course painful. But to again, if you develop the spiritual detachment, spiritual knowledge, then yes, this body is a machine, it's going to break down. We don't think I'm going to destroy it. Now, as far as the future is concerned, even if suppose we don't go to Krishna, but we will go closer to Krishna. If we have practiced bhakti in this life, then Krishna will take us to a place where we can continue the practice of bhakti. If we consider that we are souls who have been through so many lifetimes in the past, and maybe in the past we had practically no inclination to turn toward Krishna, maybe we had no knowledge of Krishna also. But still, through all those lifetimes, Krishna has guided us, and we have gone through it all. So when we had no inclination toward Krishna, and that time Krishna guided us through, now we are trying to serve him, why will he not guide us? So we have uh, that uh, understanding that if we are moving toward Krishna, Krishna will take that opportunity away from us. Maybe circumstantially we are born somewhere where the opportunity may not be immediately available, but it will become manifest. So in general, uh, it's best to focus on doing our part. If we do our part, the Krishna will take care of his part. The consciousness is there is uh, okay, we are doing our part. You know, and as for my perspective, I am not knowing what that has to be done. That still I can do it. But the fear is there, so anatha and so many dirt which I have in my heart, which will definitely will not take me near to the Krishna. But the next time I we heard from the all the scriptures, I may fall down in part of the because of pride or the I was just hearing the uh, the Gorilla story. He was come to the Ram and in a Krishna and he was addressed to Bhagavan. Mm -hmm. That fear is too much for us. Mm -hmm. What will happen? Because already more than Gorilla are attacking. More than Gorilla. Gorilla. Yeah. 
Kesi, you know, about the social uh, law drama, but he fell down in Krishna Lila. What if sometimes the teacher will do something that will be found and will be bothered? Again, with the scripture tells stories, any narratives, scripture usually illustrates through extremes. It is when scripture wants to show the mercy of the Lord, they show that just one Narayan Ajami chanted and he was saved from the Yamunas. Uh, somebody might use things that literally, and they say that, okay, I will just enjoy the Lord my life. When death comes, I put the gun on my head, Narayan. And they say, well, it doesn't work like that. And so that shows the magnitude of the mercy of the Lord. But that doesn't mean that is the standard way we will get mercy. So an extreme example of mercy should inspire us to commit ourselves more to the standard process of mercy, standard process for gaining mercy. So just as there can be extreme positive examples of mercy, there can also be extreme negative examples of danger. Examples of danger, danger. So, so Jad Bharat, Bharat Maharaj getting attached to a deer. That's an extreme example. Similarly, Dravida uh, getting deviated like that. That's that's a danger. But danger is always there in the material world. That doesn't mean that we have to live in constant fear. It is now again Dravida, you could say that there's a it's a there are multiple things going on over there. There is primarily the point that characters in Ram Leela who did exalted things, who did wonderful things. And we have Jambavan also, he initially opposes Krishna and he fights with Krishna. But then he doesn't continue doing that. Now Dravida, unfortunately, he just is is become way too off the track. So now there also if you see the Krishna Sitra because of association. Because he has association. He associated with demoniac people like Banasana, that's how he got contaminated. So it it is see fall if if somebody deviates or falls down on the spiritual path, it is not by chance or accident or it is the first slip that might be by chance or accident. Like Ajamil saw something. Now that was an accident. But after that, Ajamil dwelt on it. And then when he called that prostitute to his home and he rejected his wife, he rejected his parents at that time, then it was not that. It was just one fall. It was a series of actions. So, uh, and at that time, he probably, maybe his parents, his elders, he was a Brahman. So others must have counseled him, others have chastised him. But he neglected it all. So it's not, it doesn't happen by chance. By chance, some danger may come in our life. And we may, we may fall, we may slip, we may fall. So it's the first mistake may happen by chance. The second mistake may be also by chance. But when, we, when the repetition happens, it's not just by chance or accident. It's, a, it's, a, it's our own misuse of the So what can we do how to prepare for that? So if we use our free will properly right now, then that also creates impressions in our mind. That also becomes a habit. And if we have cultivated a healthy habit, then even if in the future some temptation comes for us, if we, our habit will protect us. So it's like if right now we make a habit of always valuing the association of devotees, then that habit will carry over with us to a future life also. And even if, say, we have the association of people who are opposed to devotion, then we will keep a distance to them. And we will seek the association of spiritually minded. So if we do what we can, Krishna will do what we can't. <laughs> Stop here. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.